Yes, and um, I will share for a moment. I will introduce Neil. Um, so the next uh, talk, we're a little bit behind. Uh, the next talk is uh, Neil Carwell from Google. He will be talking about uh, TCP PBR. So for those who are not aware of TCP PBR, uh, is a congestion control protocol, protocol that has been recently proposed. Um, and BBR is a disruption of the Windows-based, loss-based congestion control that has been used for the last 30 years. So Neil is a senior staff software engineer at Google's uh, New York City office. Uh, he entered the UC Berkeley PhD program in 96 and then followed his advisor, Tom Anderson, to the University of Washington, where he completed the master degree in 1999 with the research RN TCP congestion control. He worked with, um, he worked at Steve McKean, Fast Forward Networks from 99 to 2002. He has worked at Google since 2002 on projects including uh, GFE, uh, Google Bot, Routing Performance, and the open source Packet Drill Network Stack Testing Tool, uh, and Linux TCP Congestion Control and Loss Recovery. He is currently a member of the congestion control team at Google, and his recent focus is uh, TCP BBR. Uh, welcome, Neil. Thank you for uh, being part of this event. And I will switch to you right now. Great. Thank you so much for, uh, for that introduction. Um, can you hear my audio OK? I can hear you well. OK, great. So let me, um, let me try to share my screen and, and um, give the presentation here. Uh, Let's see. Can you guys uh, see a slide up there? Yes. We okay, can, we can great. See. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, workshop to present. Um, this is a really uh, nice opportunity for us. Um, so I'd like to talk today about uh, BBR congestion control, um, which we think of as a model-based uh, congestion control algorithm. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, uh, over the course of the presentation. Um, so this is joint work with my colleagues at Google, uh, Yu Chung and Sohail and Priyaranjan and Yusuk and Kevin, uh, Ian and Victor and Bin, who work on the quick implementation of BBR, uh, and then Luke and uh, our senior research colleagues, uh, Matt Mathis and uh, Van Jacobson. Uh, you may uh, recognize Van's name actually as the um, original developer of the uh, original congestion control algorithm for the internet, uh, TCP Reno, uh, back in the late 1980s. So it's been a, a privilege to work with Van. Um, all right, so um, so just a quick outline of what I thought I'd talk about today. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, talking about um, BBR and its uh, motivations and the basic model, um, and then BBR version two, the uh, version that we're currently working on and uh, currently rolling out. And then I'd like to do a sort of a quick summary of uh, traditional TCP Reno and qubit congestion control algorithms uh, with BBR version two. Uh, and then I'll provide some links for further information if you're interested in finding out more about BBR or participating in discussions or testing. Uh, and then I'll wrap up with the conclusion and hopefully there'll be some time for a Q&A at the end as well. Um, so first, uh, BBR. So BBR as a project um, basically started when we were noticing some serious problems um, at uh, Google that all basically boiled down to loss-based congestion control as their root cause. Um, it goes back, uh, the story goes back at least as far back as, as 2011 when uh, many people in the networking community were starting to notice and discuss um, excessive buffering and super high delays, uh, particularly on the edge of the internet uh, in, in the last mile, so to speak. Uh, and this um, issue was given the, the term buffer bloat and has been widely discussed uh, ever since. Um, and we, of course, um, as uh, a site that sends a lot of traffic to the edge of the internet, especially YouTube and Google.com, we saw that problem as well. 
Um, and then in 2012, um, people started noticing that the single connection HTTP2 protocol was actually, in many cases, uh, slower than the older protocol, HTTP 1.1, um, which was making use of multiple TCP connections. And in, in lossy links, that could be a, a real issue. Um, then in 2013, internally at Google, uh, we started noticing that a lot of t teams were seeing poor TCP throughput on our internal uh, high-speed wide area networks um, because they were constructed with uh, shallow buffer uh, switches. Um, and Jason did a nice job of, of summarizing some of the uh, serious issues and problems you can run into with these kinds of switches when you try to do uh, high-speed uh, wide area transfers. Uh, and we were seeing those issues at Google as well. Um, and so if we think about all of these problems together um, and think about what is the common underlying uh, cause of these problems, it's basically loss-based uh, congestion control. So uh, the original congestion control algorithm for TCP that was added in the late 1980s um, is uh, today we call it Reno. Um, and then around 2007, 2008, uh, Cubic uh, came out and has been the default on Linux since around 2008 and has been also gradually adopted by other vendors as well. So um, the basic problem with loss-based congestion control is that um, pack, a single packet loss alone is not really a good proxy for the presence of sustained congestion. And in particular, the kinds of problems you can run into are that um, you can get packet loss before there is sustained congestion. And when that happens, loss-based congestion control is very sensitive, or um, as, as Jason said, I think uh, maybe it's uh, sort of brittle or timid. Um, and it achieves low throughput in, in this kind of scenario. And in particular, if we think about um, a sort of high-speed wide area network transfer, you know, let's take some round numbers, um, like a 10 gigabit uh, link that we're trying to saturate, and the round trip time is 100 milliseconds. Say it's coast to coast across North America, or North America to Europe, or North America to Asia, or vice versa. In those kinds of paths, it turns out with, uh, even with uh, Cubic, which is the sort of de facto default congestion control these days for Linux and other operating systems, even for Cubic, you're going to need a packet loss rate that is about 1 in 30 million, which is, for most network scenarios, uh, infeasible. It's really difficult to achieve those low packet loss rates, um, and that's the kind of um, difficulty that uh, Jason would spend a nice um, discussion uh, presenting these, these sort of difficulties that you run into trying to achieve those low loss rates and then troubleshoot them and, and root cause them when they do occur. So it's a, it's a serious problem um, to try to achieve those loss rates. And if we think about what um, you can achieve at loss rates that are, that are e easier to achieve over the public internet, for example, uh, like 1% loss, although that's feasible, and if you then look at the, lot, the throughput that you can achieve with Reno or Cubic over a path like that, you're only going to get about three megabits per second, um, which is terrible utilization if you're um, trying to make use of your 10 gigabit um, network interface and maybe even 10 gigabit bottleneck link. So, so those are the, um, some of the problems that we saw when losses come before congestion, which often happens in shallow buffers. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we can think about what happens if you have losses that come after congestion, which is what you have when you have a super deep buffer, uh, as is often the case at the end, uh, at the edge of the public internet in the last mile to consumer uh, links. Uh, and in those cases, basically, uh, TCP, and Cubic, and Reno end up uh, filling those buffers and causing high latency. So then if we try to drill down and think about why is this happening. Um, of course, real networks, uh, unfortunately, are quite complex, right? There are you know, thousands or in the, of machines, or in the case of the public internet, billions of devices that are all trying to use and share uh, this shared resource, you know, the, the internet. Um, but the good news is that actually we can model a particular network path uh, with a fairly simple model. Um, 
And this kind of uh, diagram goes back uh, to the late uh, 80s from uh, uh, Van's original um, TCP congestion avoidance and control in a paper in, in 1988 or, or, or so. Um, and we can think about a, a model of a network path that looks like the following, where on the left we have a sender that's sending data packets, these uh, shaded gray rectangles going through the network. Um, and then on the right we have a receiver that's re receiving the data packets and then sending acknowledgement packets that say, yes, I received um, the following data from, from you. Um, and in any given network path, there's going to be um, a bottleneck link, basically the, the link that has the lowest available bandwidth for a particular network flow. And that's going to determine the rate at which that sender can push information through the network. And at that bottleneck, if the sender sends faster than the available bandwidth, uh, a queue will start to form. And you can see in this diagram, we have a queue that has started to form there at that, that bottleneck. And that queue creates higher and higher loss as more packets queue there. And eventually, you know, there's, as you can see in the diagram, there's sort of limited space for those packets. And if that queue fills up completely, then any further packets that arrive at faster than that bottleneck rate will then be dropped because there's just no buffer space for those packets. So that is a nice sort of simple network model that we can use to think about the behavior of, uh, of a flow going over a network. And so if we think about that model and then ask what happens as a flow puts more and more packets in flight, uh, we can look at a diagram like the following. So here we have two diagrams, uh, one on top of the other. On the bottom, um, the x-axis uh, is the amount of data in flight, and the y-axis is the delivery rate, or the achieved bandwidth. And on the top diagram, the x-axis is again the amount of data in flight in the network, and the y-axis is the round trip time. Uh, which gives you the, the round trip delay for a data packet to go across the network to the receiver and then the acknowledgement to come back to the sender. And as we look at this um, and we think about a sender that is starting to send data, it'll start with a very small amount of data on flight um, over here on the left side. Uh, I don't know, do you guys see a, uh, my cursor as I move this? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll pre oh, you do. Okay, great. Um, so over here on the left, we can imagine a sender that's uh, starting up, uh, and it will put more and more data in flight. And as it does this, at first, things look great. We're getting a higher and higher delivery rate or bandwidth, and our round trip time is staying stable at probably something close to the two-way propagation delay of the bits just traveling over those wires with no queue. But something uh, start interesting starts to happen once we get to this point here uh, that's called the bandwidth delay product, uh, which Jason, uh, again, did a nice job of, of discussing, uh, is sort of the, a key amount of data to keep in flight in the network. Um, and if you go beyond that, uh, you find that you've reached the full bandwidth available to that flow. But what starts to happen is the round trip time starts to go up and up and up as more data is queued in the network and you're pushing the queue to be longer and longer. At some point, once you have reached essentially a point that's around the BDP plus your buffer size, then you start to see that the buffer is completely full and any extra data that's added is then dropped and you start to get packet loss. And by their nature, what happens with loss-based congestion controls like Cubic and Reno is they tend to seek an operating point that is pretty close to this buffer full point. Um, because they're repeatedly driving the in-flight up until the point where they see packet loss and then backing off uh, some amount. Um, so in the case of loss-based congestion control, you will get, uh, you can get high throughput in this deep buffered case, but you will also see high uh, delays. So um, if we then ask ourselves, what does the picture look like in a shallow buffer uh, scenario? Uh, like the scenarios that Jason was talking about, if you have uh, just your typical uh, data center commodity switch uh, with a couple of megabytes of buffering, and you try to run a, a high-speed WAN transfer over it, the kinds of problems you run into are the kind depicted here, where even with um, uh, this high-speed um, network equipment, 
because the buffer is so shallow, anytime a couple of bursts happen to collide and cause packet loss in that buffer, the TCP flows back off multiplicatively to um, half of their old sending rate of Reno or 30% below with cubic. Uh, basically, this puts them at an operating point that's over here, where yes, the delay is low, but the throughput is also quite low. And so you end up with poor utilization of your um, high-speed path if you run in uh, TCP Reno or cubic loss-based congestion control uh, over this shallow buffered path. So those are the two kinds of problems with deep buffered bottlenecks and shallow buffered bottlenecks with traditional loss-based congestion control. So um, as you've probably already uh, intuited just from looking at these graphs um, and perhaps from Jason's description of the bandwidth delay product earlier, the optimal point where you want to operate is really at this point where the amount of data in flight is equal to the bandwidth delay product. And uh, you know, in this simple model, you can see that that is the amount of data that will give you the maximum throughput and still allow you to have the minimum delay. And this was uh, not just intuitive, but this has been proved by uh, Kleinrock, who did a lot of uh, fundamental work in queuing theory um, back in the 1970s and early 80s. So um, if we want to think about how we might want to estimate or how we might be able to estimate where that operating point is, one way to think about it is that it, the bandwidth is the um, point where the bandwidth has reached its maximum value and the RTT is the point where it has reached its minimum value. And so in a simple model like this, we can see that the BDP is really just the point that has the maximum bandwidth times um, the, the minimum round trip time that we see. So then that sort of suggests an approach we might take to estimate where that point is. So if we want to estimate where the minimum round trip time is, we uh, can take an approach, um, for example, uh, as is taken in, in PPR, where you can estimate the minimum round trip time of the path by taking a windowed min of the recent round trip time samples that you've seen over some particular recent window of time. Uh, and that can give you at least an approximate estimate of what that minimum round trip time is. Similarly, for the maximum bandwidth point, you can form an, at least an estimate of that by taking a windowed maximum of the bandwidth samples or bandwidth measurements that you've taken recently. And that can allow you to get an estimate of where that BDP is. So one interesting and, and somewhat tricky aspect of this that you might have already intuited as well is that there's this sort of dilemma where you can really only measure the minimum round trip time if your amount of data is below the BDP and you can really only measure the maximum bandwidth if your amount of data is above the BDP. And so as a consequence, if you want to, to maintain a model that is able to give decent estimates of both of those parameters, you actually need to spend some time as a sender on both sides of the BDP so that you can refresh or, or see the, a good estimate of those parameters. So that basically in a nutshell is what BBR tries to do. So, BBR is a congestion control algorithm, um, and as an acronym, you can sort of think about it standing for uh, bottleneck bandwidth and round trip propagation time, because those are the two model parameters that are the core of its uh, model. And indeed, at the core of BBR is this notion of trying to build an explicit model of the network path where we're dynamically estimating uh, the windowed maximum bandwidth and the windowed minimum round trip time and updating that model on every acknowledgement that the sender receives. And then using that mo model, we then control the sending process um, to sequentially probe both the, the maximum bandwidth and the minimum round trip time to feed that model samples. And then we pace out the packets that we're sending to try to stay near that estimated bandwidth to try to avoid um, or queuing or at least control the, the level of queuing um, and keep it lower. And then we vary that pacing rate to keep the in-flight at or near the estimated uh, bandwidth delay product. So that's the, that's the basic uh, model of the algorithm. And the goal of the algorithm to, is to seek high throughput with uh, a small queue. And um, 
VBR version one um, targeted basically approaching the maximum available throughput for random losses up to about 15%. And then um, VBR, both version one and version two, um, maintain a small uh, bounded queue that is sort of independent of the depth of the buffer. Um, so let me uh, talk, jump in then and, and talk a little bit about VBR version two and, and how it's a little bit different and make some improvements. So what's new in version two? So there are a couple of key properties that we see as fundamental goals of VBR as an algorithm. Them. And so we are basically focused on maintaining those properties. Um, and those key properties are high throughput with a targeted level of, of packet loss. And then second, uh, a bounded level of queuing delay, uh, no matter how deep or bloated the bottleneck buffer is. And uh, while maintaining those key properties, we've also made some improvements between version one and version two. So one of the improvements we've made is, is improving the way that BBR coexists when sharing bottlenecks with uh, the older loss-based algorithms, uh, Reno and Cubic. Um, and another improvement that we made is to reduce the uh, amount of packet loss that happens when the bottleneck buffer is on the smaller side. Um, and then we've also worked on uh, and achieved much higher throughput for paths with higher degrees of aggregation or uh, batching and bursting of packets, which is a, a really big dynamic on Wi-Fi and cellular paths. Um, in addition, BBR version two responds to uh, DCTCP or L4S style uh, ECN signals, where ECN stands for uh, explicit congestion notification, um, which is a, a way that routers can um, signal congestion by marking a bit in the IP header instead of dropping packets, uh, for example. Um, and then finally, the last improvement is that we've uh, vastly reduced the, the throughput reduction that flows C when they're in that mode where they're probing the RTT by reducing the amount of uh, data in flight. And then in, the, in a few slides, I'll show some uh, performance uh, tests to give you an example of the kind of uh, performance properties of BBRv2. So um, before I do that, though, let me just quickly summarize um, the differences between um, Cubic and BBR version 1 and BBR version 2. So Cubic um, is not really uh, what you would call a model-based congestion control. So there are what we would think of as, as model parameters characterizing the network up here in the top left. Um, it's most basic. Uh, dynamic is basically when there is any kind of packet loss uh, in, per round trip time with packet loss, it will reduce its congestion window that determines how fast it sends by 30%. Um, and then if there's ECN available, it, the ECN senders that are out there now in Linux and other OSs are obeying a protocol uh, called RFC 3168, which basically says it, on any ECN mark, you reduce reduce your CWIND just as you would if you saw a packet loss. And, and so as a result, it doesn't give you much of a performance win relative to a, um, a bottleneck with uh, using packet drops as a signal uh, as long as the bottleneck has a, a reasonable size buffer. So as a result, because there's not much of a performance win, people haven't actually deployed this um, in the network, uh, in networks. Um, and then so finally, Cubic, when it's starting up, it uses an approach called slow start where it doubles its sending rate uh, every round trip time until it sees the delays of the network start to rise or it sees any packet loss. So that's sort of Cubic in a nutshell. Uh, if we think about BBRv1, um, it is a model-based congestion control. And so at the core of its model are those two parameters I discussed, um, the throughput or bandwidth uh, or delivery rate and then the network minimum round trip time. And in BBRv1, over the long run, there's not really uh, a, an explicit response to packet loss in contrast with Cubic, um, and it doesn't pay attention at all to ECN. And uh, its startup behavior is basically to start up uh, doubling its sending rate, just like Cubic, and then it will exit that startup behavior when it sees its delivery rate or throughput hits a plateau or ceiling. So BBRv2 um, is a little bit different from BBRv1. 
So its model is richer. It has a model of not just the throughput in RTT of the path, but also the maximum degree of aggregation that the path is showing. Um, since, as I mentioned, that's particularly an issue in Wi-Fi and cellular links, but is also even a big phenomenon on high-speed Ethernet, since they use um, uh, particular aggregation methods with Ethernet uh, NICs as well. And then finally, it has a new parameter that is the maximum volume of in-flight data that it wants to maintain to achieve a, a good operating point. Uh, and whereas BBRv1 was completely agnostic to loss, packet loss uh, on, long, on the long term, um, BBRv2 actually has an explicit uh, target ceiling for the loss rate that it wants to see in any particular round trip time of uh, 2%. So that's the worst it wants to ever see or cause. And it, it tries to then maintain a loss rate that is um, then a fraction of that uh, on average. Uh, and whereas BBRv1 was completely agnostic to ECN, BBRv2 does um, use DCTCP or L4S uh, style ECN signals that are more and more widely deployed in data center environments. And um, the L4S standard is, is a version of ECN that is working its way through the internet standards process uh, to be deployed on the public internet. And in fact, is already a part of the cable modem standard, uh, DOCSIS 3.1. So that's something that's coming down the road, and BBR is able to take uh, take advantage of that. Uh, and then finally, BBRv2, when it's starting, uh, it's it doubles its uh, sending rate every round trip time until either the throughput plateaus, as in BBR version one, or either the ECN or loss rate is above its uh, target levels. So it can use those signals to stop its its rapid ramp up uh, in its initial phase. So that's just sort of a quick summary of a BBR uh, version one, version two, and qubit. So um, if we put this into a picture in terms of how the algorithm works, basically um, the algorithm itself is this gray box. And as input into the algorithm, uh, there are measurements from the network traffic that the sender is sending through the network. And then it's getting signals from the acknowledgments from the receiver. And those are in the form of throughput measurements, uh, delay measurements, loss, packet loss measurements, and ECN mark measurements. And those are taken as inputs into the network path model. Um, and then the model feeds a state machine that then controls uh, three parameters that control the behavior of the TCP or quick sender. And those are the, the pacing rate, the rate at which the sender will send, the maximum volume or amount of data in the network, and then what you might call a quantum or uh, the size, the maximum size of a burst that the sender is willing to send if it has a, an offload mechanism that it needs to use to run at high speeds with low CPU utilization, which is basically ubiquitous for um, gigabit uh, network devices and faster. So those three parameters go into the transport protocol sending engine, either TCP or QUIC or other protocol. And so the sender data comes into that sending engine gets chopped up into uh, bursts of a particular quantum size, and then sent out on the, the network. And that's sort of the picture of the uh, BBR algorithm and sort of how it fits in with the system on the, the sending host. So let me just quickly run over some graphs to give you a sort of characterization of how the algorithm behaves um, in in the kinds of scenarios that we see on, on networks. So first I wanted to, to sort of show you a picture to characterize how BBR um, version one and version two uh, both target achieving high uh, throughput, that is high utilization of the bottleneck, with uh, in the case of BBR2, it's targeting um, a an ability to survive and thrive in an environment where there is up to about a 1% packet loss uh, level. So that's the kind of um, level that you might see uh, be operationally feasible both over the public internet or a, um, a very busy high-speed um, uh, network in a, in a research organization or a large um, internet company. So on this graph, we see on the x-axis, um, there is the uh, emulated degree of random packet loss, and this is in percent. 
So um, over on the, uh, the left side, we have uh, 10 to the minus 5 uh, percent uh, packet loss. And over on the right side, we have 1 percent and then 10 percent uh, packet loss. And we can see that cubic, uh, shown here in red, um, achieves um, a, a, only about uh, a 30 to 35 percent packet um, utilization over here, even with very, very low uh, loss rates, as you were seeing in uh, the graphs that Jason was showing for a path with uh, um, uh, a significant round trip time. So Jason was showing very varying round trip times. Here, this graph is showing a scenario where the bottleneck bandwidth is one gigabit and the uh, network RTT is 100 milliseconds. And there is a nice uh, one BDP of buffer, which is a nice, uh, nicely carefully sized buffer. But you can see that Cubic, even under these um, pretty reasonable um, conditions is able to achieve only a quite low loss, uh, a quite low utilization or throughput. And you see as the loss rate approaches even uh, a hundredth of a percent, the utilization is quite poor. Um, so by contrast, um, BBR version one was uh, um, targeting a very high utilization at all of these uh, loss rates up to, you know, you can see around the 15% uh, level that we, uh, that I discussed previously. Um, with BBR2, we're targeting, we've, we're making a series of trade-offs um, that have basically led us to deciding that we want to try to target to um, uh, tolerating 1% random loss. And as you can see, that is roughly the level that the algorithm uh, is able to tolerate while still maintaining pretty high um, utilization. Um, and um, that sort of illustrates the, the first property of the algorithm we're trying to maintain, where it is able to be more robust than the traditionally fragile uh, loss-based congestion control algorithms in shallow buffers. So the second uh, property that BBR version one and version two uh, equally target is low queuing delay, uh, no matter how deep your buffer is. So here is a series of experiments with increasing buffer size as a multiple of the bandwidth delay product, um, starting with um, a, uh, a, a sort of reasonably sized one BDP uh, of buffer down here and increasing to 10, 50, and then 100 times the bandwidth delay product. You can see that cubic here, since it only slows down when it sees packet loss, fills the deep buffers, the increasingly deep buffers, and causes increasingly high uh, delays, which we see over here on the y-axis is the median smooth round trip time uh, sample, which is basically reflecting the average uh, queuing delay in the network. Uh, and so we see that cubic basically builds uh, deep queues, causes high delays, whereas BBR is able to find a reasonable amount of data to maintain in the network and thus keep low delays no matter how deep the buffer actually is. So um, in addition, um, uh, as I mentioned, BBR version two is able to use uh, ECN signals and is able to use those to keep delays even lower than BBR version one was able to do. So um, BBR version one, did uh, tend to keep up to a BDP of uh, or so, uh, or so up to 1.5 BDP in some case of Q in the network. But BBR version two, if there's an ECN signal, it's able to detect that and remove those cues and keep the delays nice and low. So this is an experiment illustrating that where the bottleneck sender is offering um, uh, DCTCP or L4S style ECN or explicit congestion notification signals. And we can see as we increase the number of flows here on the x-axis, um, starting at one and then going to 10 and then going to 100, whereas BBR would build a, a bounded but, um, uh, but non-zero queue up here and create uh, about you know 13 milliseconds of, of queuing delay as we uh, had um, uh, as we increase the number of flows, BBR2 is able to keep the, delo, the, the queuing delays super low, even with an increasing number of flows, because it's able to use those ECN signals to detect that queue and um, mitigate that and reduce the queue, the size of the queue, keeping the queuing delays low. Uh, 
So similarly in that kind of experiment, we can see that keeping the cues lower is also able to uh, um, reduce packet losses in that kind of scenario if the standing queue was large enough to fill that buffer. So you can see again, this is a, a similar, um, this is basically the same set of experiments as a previous slide, but just graphing the, the packet loss uh, or retransmission rate as we increase the number of flows. So um, uh, BBR version one would run at around 10% uh, or 15% packet loss in that particular set of experiments, whereas BBR version two keeps the delays nice uh, and low and packet loss nice and low as well. So um, finally, one of the properties that we wanted to uh, improve or, uh, in BBR version two was the way that the algorithm is sharing with any traditional loss-based uh, algorithms like we know or cubic. And this um, graph is just showing what is the bandwidth share that um, BBR version one and version two achieve um, sharing with uh, Reno or cubic in the sort of simplest scenario you can, you can imagine, which is one cubic flow and one BBR flow. And you can see that uh, with BBR version one, it was achieving uh, an unfair share of the link bandwidth, um, whereas with BBR version two, it um, is, uh, allows a, a much more fair sharing of that uh, bandwidth with the, with the qubit flow. And this is just sort of an illustrative example uh, of that behavior. So, uh, whoops, I went backwards. Um, so, just to do a final a summary or wrap up comparing um, the, the major congestion control algorithms that have been deployed on, on the internet, Reno and Cubic, with um, our team's most recent uh, algorithm, BBR version two, I just wanted to do uh, a quick recap. So um, in these diagrams, I'm gonna show sort of the, the evolution of the amount of data in flight uh, in the network uh, over the y-axis, where over time, where time is spread out over the x-axis, uh, for these different algorithms. Uh, and so the blue line is showing that for the uh, Reno algorithm, which was the, basically the, defaulto, the de facto default from about 1988 to about 2008, uh, Reno would basically ramp up rapidly uh, until it experienced uh, any single uh, packet loss, and then would cut its sending rate in a half, and then would uh, very slowly by one packet per round trip time, ramp up its sending rate until it filled the buffer and experienced another packet loss, and then it would sort of repeat that over and over. Now, this is the, uh, the this reduction by half anytime there is any single packet loss, and then this slow walk, one packet per round trip time, back up to the, um, the maximum point, is what creates that sort of brittle loss response. And it's partly because of um, this, uh, um, response to any single packet loss, and partly because of the slow linear growth over time. Well, that means it needs uh, a thousand times more time to reach a bandwidth that's a thousand times higher. So as your networks get faster, you need more and more time without experiencing even a single packet loss in order to enable Reno to reach full utilization. So that means to fill a 10 gigabit, 100 millisecond pipe, uh, you actually need more than an hour between any packet losses that this poor flow uh, experiences, which is very difficult to achieve because that means that your loss rate that you need is this tiny, tiny number, uh, two times uh, 10 to the negative 10, which is very, very difficult to achieve. Um, so Cubic then is also a loss-based uh, algorithm, but it makes some improvements in the shape of its probing curve. Uh, so instead of a, a slow linear walk up to the maximum point, its uh, sending rate actually traces a, a sort of elegant cubic curve over time. Um, but, that, uh, but the shape of that curve and the scale of that curve is such that the loss response at the end of the day is still fairly brittle. Um, and one way to think about this is that because of the nature of the cubic curve, um, you, you end up needing uh, 10 times more time still to reach 1,000 times higher bandwidth 
And so that means you still need long periods of time between any single packet loss before you can uh, maintain full utilization. And in particular, to utilize a 10 gigabit 100 millisecond path, you need 40 whole seconds between any packet losses, which while better than Reno is still a very long time to keep your flow in a state where it's experiencing zero packet loss. And it tends to be um, very difficult to achieve in, in practice. So by contrast, um, BBR version two has a similar uh, startup or doubles its uh, sending rate. Um, it is aware of loss and ECN signals as well as um, it, uh, saturating the bandwidth. And when it um, notices uh, that it has caused excessive Q pressure, uh, it backs off, uh, leaves some headroom in the network, and then restarts again, uh, probing until it sees either a bandwidth plateau or uh, packet, um, packet loss or ECN rates that are above its target. And so BBR is basically about uh, achieving a, a bounded loss tolerance uh, and scalable growth. And it, um, it can, because, it, because of the way the probing is structured, it can use new bandwidth in an amount of time that is logarithmic in the scale of the BDP, which means that it can take a much shorter amount of time to reach uh, full utilization of the path. Um, and instead of needing hours, in the, as is in the case of Reno, or 40, 40 seconds, as in the case of Cubic, uh, with zero packet loss, you can actually fully utilize a 10 gigabit 100 millisecond path with BBR version two, where you're having um, up to uh, uh, loss thresh um, degree of packet loss in every round, where right now in the design, that amount of packet losses is, is 1%. So you can have 1% packet losses in every round trip time uh, and still achieve uh, uh, high utilization of that path. So, um, that is a sort of lightning uh, introduction to BBR version one and version two. And I wanted to provide some links for further information. If you're interested in reading up uh, on BBR or you're interested in taking it out for a spin. So um, BBR version one is uh, already available in uh, Linux and in Quick. Uh, and now BBR version two uh, has an alpha or preview release that is available uh, from our team's uh, repository on GitHub. You can find it at github.com slash google slash BBR. Uh, and that will give you basically a, uh, a recent Linux kernel with uh, BBR version two in its TCP implementation. Uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, take that out for a spin. Uh, also, BBR version two is implemented for the Quick transport protocol, which is a UDP based transport protocol that is currently making its way through the internet standards process and is also used between, for example, uh, if you use the Chrome network browser and you go to a Google or YouTube site, you're using um, Quick probably to talk to Google or uh, YouTube. So that protocol has a BBR version two implementation as well that you can take a look at. And uh, BBR version two uh, is, uh, ready for research experiments, and uh, we invite researchers to share their uh, ideas for test cases and scenarios, uh, use case scenarios that are important to them, uh, metrics that uh, should be evaluated. We're interested in hearing test results from people. We're interested in algorithm or code ideas. Uh, we're always happy to see patches or look at packet traces to help uh, troubleshoot issues. Um, and just to give you a snapshot of, of where BBR version 2 is in its deployment at Google, uh, it's been deployed for uh, a small percentage of, of YouTube users on an experimental basis to help iterate on the algorithm and improve it. Uh, we're seeing that it is reducing queuing delays uh, below the already low levels that we see with uh, BBR version 1. Um, and it's also reducing packet loss levels uh, relative to BBR version 1. Uh, and internally within Google, we're also um, continuing uh, the test pilot and rollout program. So it's now used um, between and within uh, uh, most Google data centers at this point. Um, and it's being uh, deployed as the default TCP congestion control for uh, internal Google traffic. Uh, and we are continuing to iterate uh, using our production experiments and uh, lab tests as well. So 
Uh, if you're looking for more information on VBR, um, we've been describing it and our work on it at the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force or IETF meetings. Um, there are uh, slides at, at the IETF 104 and 105. Um, and then uh, there's a nice uh, blog post by an engineer at Dropbox who published results from their uh, TCP VBR version 2 production experiments um, showing uh, the kind of uh, benefits that VBR v2 has over v v1. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the code is available on GitHub. And then there's also a, a BBR mailing list um, that's, that's hosted on Google Groups. Um, and that list is called BBR-dev. And uh, if you're interested in learning more and following updates or discussions about BBR, I, I recommend joining that group. Um, you're, that's also a great place to ask questions. If you have any questions about how to get started with BBR or any um, uh, test results you want to share, that's that's a great place to share it. The landing page also has uh, a lot of information about BBR. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we're actively working on BBR version 2 congestion control at Google, uh, continuing to tune and improve its performance and doing a full-scale uh, rollout at Google. Uh, and we're working on improving the algorithm uh, to uh, scale to larger and larger numbers of flows and keep queue pressure and queuing delays and packet loss rates even lower. Uh, and we uh, invite the community to uh, try the open source version of BBR version 2 uh, and share any test results they have, any issues they see, any ideas they might have. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that work is underway on BBR at, um, for FreeBSD as well. If any of you run FreeBSD, uh, that was work done at uh, free, uh, Netflix by their TCP team, which we stay in uh, close uh, communication with. So um, I just wanted to leave this URL up uh, for the, the uh, BBR dev group, which has also a landing page with many links. And I wanted to uh, send a shout out and a thanks to the people listed below who have been a big help to our team. And then um, if there's time left for a q and uh, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions folks might have. Thank you, Neil. Um, this is a great presentation. There are several questions, so I will read some of them. Um, the first one is, uh, how well does a single BBR stream work in a network full of cubic Reno streams? So the, um, uh, the single BBR flow should do quite well in that environment. Um, it should reach uh, at least its um, fair share. Um, and uh, in, um, in BBR version one, it might um, grab more than its fair share. Um, with BBR version two, we are, tr we are um, uh, designing the algorithm to um, coexist in a, a manner that um, has a more fair allocation of bandwidth in those kinds of scenarios. So um, BBR version two is definitely um, the algorithm to test if that's a kind of scenario that's uh, important to you. The, the next question, um, can you chat about when one side use BBR version two, the other side use cubic? Uh, seems like it works when the sender is using BBR version two, so the receiver doesn't need to run BBR version two. I'm reading. Uh, can you comment about this? Yes, that's exactly right. So um, with both TCP and Quick, the congestion control algorithm runs entirely on the sender. And so if you're choosing a new congestion control algorithm, you only need to run that on the sender and then the sender will, will change its behavior and you can um, achieve all of the benefits purely by, by changing the algorithm run on the sender. Um, the next question, how is it possible for a BBR version two to deal with the fairness drawbacks of BBR version one? Does BBR use ECN by default? Uh, is it possible to modify the network model of BBR uh, BBR or adjust any parameter for testing without recompiling the kernel in Linux? Uh, let's see. Yeah, let me see if I can remember and, and respond to all of those. So um, 
so let's see, one of them was about ECN. So ECN response is not enabled by default with BBRv2. Um, there is a module parameter in the kernel module that allows you to enable that. Um, and that's uh, documented on the uh, readme. Um, in terms of how BBR version two um, uh, can be more, uh, can share bandwidth more fairly with Reno and Cubic, um, there are a couple of different mechanisms that um, uh, allow it to achieve that. One of them is um, simply the, the fact that it ach achieves uh, lower loss rates. Um, another is that it leaves, it explicitly leaves headroom in the bottleneck buffer when there are multiple um, flows sharing that buffer. And then a third one, um, a third mechanism is that BBRv2 explicitly adapts the time scale of its bandwidth probing in a manner that is explicitly conscious of the time scales for bandwidth um, probing and, and packet loss response that are used by Reno and Cubic to allow longer periods of time between packet loss to allow those Reno and Cubic flows to ramp up further and uh, achieve their, their fair share. Uh, and then there was a third one that I've, I've forgotten this, at this point. Can you remind me of the third question in there? Yeah, is it possible to modify the network model of BBR or adjust parameters without recompiling the kernel? Right. So in BBR version one, um, there is we intentionally omitted uh, knobs for tuning. We figured that um, for uh, folks in research environments where they wanted to do that, uh, they would be able to go ahead and, and modify the source code themselves. Um, for BBR version two, since that is um, currently in a research phase um, and the, the final version of the code has not been submitted to the, the uh, uh, mainline Linux uh, repository, we did leave the tuning parameters in as module parameters. So you can, uh, if you build a, a kernel with BBR version two using our sources, there are um, uh, module parameters that you can use to dynamically at runtime uh, tweak the behavior of the algorithm for testing uh, just by setting um, those module parameters uh, by echoing, you know, the, the value you want into uh, a file in the sys uh, uh, file space. Okay. Um, the so there is uh, another one. Um, in what cases is BR, BBR not suitable and does not perform well? Uh, do, you, do you see any of those cases? Um, so with BBR version one, there were some scenarios where it, it um, did not achieve good throughput. Uh, and I sort of alluded to some of those earlier. So the biggest one we noticed was with um, paths where the Wi where uh, the bottleneck was a Wi-Fi link and the the round trip time of the path was low, um, the utilization of BBR could be uh, quite poor in, in BBR version one. So as I mentioned in, in V2, that is one of the things that um, has been improved and um, uh, largely fixed as, as far as we're aware. Um, and uh, so, so that is one um, area where BBR version one was not doing well. It has been improved. Another um, Im improvement has been that um, in some scenarios, BBR version one could cause a higher packet loss rate than is desired in scenarios where multiple BBR flows were competing with either other BBR flows or cubic flows in a, a relatively shallow buffer. And that is another thing that's basically been um, targeted uh, as a, in a focused effort in BBR version two, so that BBR version two explicitly uh, targets a much lower loss rate in those scenarios. So that we think it's um, uh, reaching acceptable levels of performance with version two. So there are so these areas um, where we did see issues with BBR version one. Uh, we think BBR version two largely addresses those. And we're right now in a research phase and, and testing phase where we're uh, iterating to improve that and, and looking to hear feedback from 
from researchers um, who are interested in, in testing it to ensure that it, BBR version 2 is uh, meeting people's needs uh, in the various um, use cases that uh, people use uh, TCP and, and Quick out there in the world. Um, there are still some, I, I will pick up one here, the last one. Um, Neil, this is how can the use of programmable switches enhance uh, BBR? Uh, I guess, can you incorporate feedback from the switches from the routers with these new programmable switches? Right. Um, so it's definitely the case that um, more explicit and richer feedback from the switches can help. Uh, and you know, I, I just briefly discussed one form, one simple form of that in terms of uh, explicit congestion notification or ECN, um, which is available in many routers uh, these days. Um, many times, you can even use that in, in older switches just by using a, a red module and, and configuring the threshold, the you know, sort of. Uh, floor and ceiling uh, parameters to be the same um, buffer size, um, but that's uh, even a simple way to to provide better uh, feedback. So, um, using programmable switches, I can imagine you could do, you know, you could certainly implement that style of ECN signaling and and see nice improvements. Over the um, long run, I think. Um, it, there are interesting research opportunities in terms of providing an even richer signal to the, the transport center that would communicate not just the presence of congestion, um, but the extent of the congestion in terms of the Q uh, depth. So um, there's a, a research direction called in-network telemetry or INT. Um, that is, has been sort of exploring these kinds of ideas. And I do think that that is a, an interesting um, research direction and could be useful for uh, allowing congestion control algorithms to respond more quickly when there are sudden bursts of, connection, of congestion that build these long queues. Um, because the, if the bottleneck can signal the extent of that queuing, that can help the congestion control sender uh, back off more quickly. So I, I do think that is a valuable research direction, yes.